I have to say, when I woke up this morning, I had no idea where I was, because I arrived in Australia last Sunday, and I've bounced from city to city. But when I looked outside, I realised why Adelaide is such a nice city, because the sun is shining, and it's absolutely wonderful. Your winter here is warmer than my summer in the Netherlands. So I was actually asked to try and sort of philosophise a bit about diagnosing invasive fungal diseases in the 21st century. It's a very grand title. <clears throat> but in fact, I've been in and out of this field for 30 years um, following the developments. And one thing I know about fungi and, and fungal diseases is it's taken a long time to get to where we are today. And it's by no means perfect. But I think we have the tools, as I hope to show you, that will actually help us on the way to getting a grip on this problem, which is probably going to increase as we treat more patients and make them immune suppressed in a variety of different ways. It used to be traditionally just haematology and cancer patients, stem cell transplants. But as you look across the literature, you're finding it, particularly invasive aspergillosis in the strangest of places. So it's not going to be a problem that's going to go away anytime soon. Uh, th there are my disclosures. I, you don't have to read them all. There are a lot of them, but most of them are, are actually to do with potential conflicts of interest. Of course, I don't actually have any conflicts of interest. I'm just disclosing these potential ones. So I've broken my talk into five kind of blocks. A very important part, which I was involved in from the very beginning, was defining invasive fungal disease. Part of that was arose from the fact that we were, everyone was unhappy about the way diagnosis was actually determined and the terminology that was used. There was a variety of different terminologies used and we were fortunate to have a Turkish doctor who actually dug into the literature and assembled all the phraseologies and helped to set uh, the framework for defining invasive fungal disease. I then want to explore some of the mycological tests and then a very important thing, because we have definitions on the one hand, which are fine for trials, fine for, for um, evaluating diagnostic tests, but if you st strictly apply them in the clinic, you're going to lose a lot of patients. So one of the other things we've been doing is saying, how can we meet the clinical need? And very important, how do we integrate this together? Because actually, diagnosing invasive fungal diseases does not depend on a mycologist. It depends on a team of people. It depends on a radiologist, it depends on um, a mycologist, obviously. It depends on the clinician recognizing the problem. It depends on the nurse getting the right samples done at the right time. So it's a multidisciplinary team effort. And more and more people are recognizing that fact. And then I'm going to give a little nod to what I think the future should be. So defining invasive fungal disease. Now, one of the things that was quickly apparent was that nobody disputed what you needed to define proven invasive fungal disease. You needed tissue from the affected area in which you could detect fungus, either by culture or by microscopy. Or, in cases of yeast, for example, fusarium, when you had sterile fluid from a sterile body site like blood. So if you have that, that's evidence enough. You've made the diagnosis. You don't need any host factors. You don't need anything else. In the real world, in the clinic, that happens very seldom. Uh, one of the, the latest studies published, 1% of their potential cases was actually defined as proven. The rest were all were, were various degrees of certainty. So host factors are not required. You just seem, simply need the right bit of tissue managed in the right way so you can detect the fungus. <clears throat> so that left us with a problem then. How are we going to actually get that level of certainty you need in order to, to define invasive fungal disease? And we decided, given the terminology, but also given the logic behind it, degrees of certainty would be proven, and then one step down would be probable, and one step below that would be possible. And the, the question then was, what elements did we need in order to make those definitions work? The primary element we chose were host factors. And these are host factors which are clearly recognizable because they increase the likelihood and the risk that an individual will develop an invasive fungal disease. Neutropenia, a classic one, long-term corticosteroids, T-cell immune suppressants, of which is, there are probably 100 in the pipeline at the moment and several dozens already in use in the clinic. They were all clearly recognizable host factors. So that was element number one. Element number two were clinical features. Now, in the original definitions, we had very soft 
vague clinical features like cough, like dyspnea and what have you. And we realized very early on that that was not really specific enough to indicate that there might be a fungal infection involved. So what we decided to do was to uh, rely on imaging for our clinical features. And that was because we had the good fortune to actually have CT scans. Now, and now we have different types of CT scans. We used to only have high resolution, low resolution, but now we've got multi-slice CT scans, which are even more sensitive. So imaging, you need to be able to see the affected part, recognize lesions which are consistent with, if not uh, pathognomonic for an invasive fungal disease. Now there's, there's a classical CT scan, but CT scans are actually not without their problems. And one of them is simply terminology. Who looks at the CT scan? I work in the hematology department and I know that the radiologists can do what they like, but the hematologist is the one that actually decides what is seen on the CT scan, for good or ill. So one of the things we have to do is get them to talk the same language, exactly the same as we did with the lab. <clears throat> CT scans are not specific, although if you read the literature, some people claim they are. And there's actually no census on the type of CT scan what you should image, how intensely should you should image it, what the optimum timing is, how you interpret it, even how you report it. One of the things I love about radiologists, they say, well, the picture we're seeing here, on that basis, we cannot exclude the possibility that there might be an invasive fungal disease, which is actually useless to you. So one of the things we have going with the EORTC MSG now is a radiology group who are now going to look at terminology, reporting, and et cetera. And there is the issue of um, exposure to radiation. When I look back at some of our patients, I realize that they've had 10, 12, 14 CT scans in a matter of weeks. That is an enormous irradiation load. So we have to reduce that, which is why we're, we're, we're relying more often than not on, on multi-slice, low, low intensity CT scans. And last and very importantly, mycology. Now, you might not credit this, but in the def definitions group, we had 16 people from Europe and 16 people from North America, and almost all the North Americans wanted to drop mycology from the definitions. And you might ask yourself, why is that? Well, it was very simple, that in the, in the United States, the setup is, for those centers that were involved, is they don't actually rely much on laboratories at all, uh, for all kinds of reasons. But we... we, we the group as a whole eventually decided, no, we absolutely have to have mycology as one of the elements. So these three elements, host factors, clinical features, and mycology, are the pillars upon which we base our definitions. <clears throat> one of the things we realized when we were reviewing the first definitions was, if you look here, there were three different patterns for defining possible. If you look down the bottom, you have host factors, you have no clinical features, and you have mycology. That was galactomannan positive or a PCR positive or, or even sputum positive for aspergillus, should we really be calling them of sufficient level of evidence to call them possible? And we decided the answer was no, because there's no evidence of disease. The next category were patients with soft clinical features like cough, dyspnea, and what have you, or rashes even, um, where they had no mycology whatsoever. They had a host factor, soft clinical features, but no, no mycology. And we asked ourselves the, the question again, is this consistent enough with an invasive fungal disease to justify the definition of possible? And the group decided no. So in fact, we reduced and tightened up the definitions for possible. And, ob and obviously, having done this exercise twice, and we published again in 2008, we said again, these definitions were primarily for research purposes. Clinical trials, they are accepted by all the registration authorities. For uh, evaluating diagnostic tests, they're accepted by all the, the registration authorities. And also for epidemiological purposes, because at least you know everyone is a level playing field and everyone's calling what they see the same thing. So they were not intended to guide clinical practice, but we actually know people are using them to guide clinical practice. And one thing people forgot and still forget is the only difference between possible and probable is the presence or absence of mycology, emphasizing again the importance of sending the right sample at the right time to the laboratory. And the laboratory has to expect the sample and know what to do with that and also report it back to the clinician. 
So the mycology is crucially important because that is what distinguishes possible from probable. And unfortunately, when we started this, we had hoped that possible invasive fungal disease would at least be a category of patients for which you could use prophylaxis or test prophylaxis. But in fact, none of the registration authorities have accepted that, so they only accept probable and proven cases for clinical trials. And there's no way I see that changing in the near future. What about the mycological tests? Well, we kept the world simple and we defined mycological tests as direct mycology, that so-called classical mycology, where, where, where it's culture and microscopy of, of, of clinical material. And in terms of conventional tests, we have enough tests. The problem is we don't get the right samples. And in fact, for many patients, it's impossible to get the right sample. You can't stick a knife in and get tissue. You can't obtain the sample you actually want to sample because of the supposed or real dangers to the patient. If you have the right material, we have culture, we have typing, we, have anti we can do antifungal susceptibility tests. You can do, pull out all the tricks in the laboratory and do it, but without the sample, you can't. And that has bedeviled the whole field for 20, 30 years. Um, and nowadays also we have very few autopsies, so we don't even know what, why someone dies when they die. They are always presumed to have died from invasive fungal disease. Right across the world, the number of autopsies has dropped dramatically. Now, that's really bad because we will never really know how effective our diagnostics were or our therapy was. And certainly not, we will never get a true idea of what the epidemiology of the problem is. And again, all these things require the appropriate specimen taken from the appropriate site. And the simple message I always tell clinicians is no samples, no results. It's just guesswork. So how do we resolve this? And one of the ways we resolve this is by taking blood. We've got blood. We can get blood even from the most anemic patient because we actually transfuse them two to three times a week, sometimes even more often than that. So blood is easily obtainable, and you can split blood into into cell-free components, either plasma or serum. So blood is the, the principal sample which we will have available from these patients. And that allows us to look at indirect my, my, mycology, be it antigens or specific cell wall substances like beta-D-glucan, and also to use techniques like PCR to look for nucleic acid. Let's look very quickly at PCR, because I'll be talking later on uh, this morning about this in, uh, in particular. One of the groups we had in Europe, a so-called consensus group, which was a consensus group of ID uh, physicians, hematologists, microbiologists, um, pharmacists and the like, is this ESO group. And it, it, sort of, it holds sway in Europe, but not further than Europe. And they looked at PCR and looked at the evidence for PCR, and they came to the same conclusion as the EORTC MSG group, that the current status of PCR did not allow it to be recommendation for using it clinically simply because it had not been standardized or validated. And the, the FDA and the EMA in Europe take exactly the same position on this, even though lots of laboratories are actually exploring and using PCR. So one of the, that's one of the driving forces why I set up this group under the ISHAM, the, I mean, I called it the European PCR Initiative. If you come later on this morning, you'll find out why that was called the European Aspergillus PCR Initiative. But this is a group of experts, and one of our goals is actually to answer the question, can we standardize and validate, validate PCR, at least for Aspergillus? And then, of course, you've got the whole history of beta-D-glucan. Now, beta-D-glucan is very rarely used in Europe. Um, that has been explored. There have been publications. There have been at least two meta-analyses in beta-D-glucan but it's very seldom been explored. And the group that looked at this came to the conclusion that there was moderate evidence to, to support its use, but nobody knows really how best to use this test. The Japanese have been using it for years, but it's very difficult to dig into Japanese literature unless you can read Japanese. So that leaves us with Galactomana. Now, our center was one of the first centers to have the opportunity of looking at the ELISA Galactomana way back in 1989. So we've had a long experience of this, and we've had at least two PhDs um, looking at galactomannan. And when you look at galactomannan, the first thing that strikes you if you actually look at the manufacturer's instructions are they're very non-committal. They simply say an index of less than 0.5 are considered to be negative for the antigen. They make no statements about diagnosis. 
They simply say detecting the antigen or not detecting the antigen. And that reminds us that these tests are adjunctive tests. You cannot base the diagnosis of an invasive fungal disease on the basis of any indirect test whatsoever. It form, and so it emphasizes the importance of the definitions that mycology is one of the three elements you need to satisfy if you're going to make a diagnosis. Um, there have been two large meta-analyses. This is the Cochrane analysis. Why I like this is because they looked at three different thresholds because the history of this, this test started off with a threshold of 1.5 dropped down to 1, and finally it dropped down to 0.5. So in the 20 years, the threshold has dropped. And they looked at the question, do, what difference does this actually make? If you look down the column specificity, you will see that most of these studies were fairly specific, but the sensitivity is all over the place. And part of the reason for that has nothing to do with the test. Part of the reason is the nature of the population. Some of them were case series. Some of them were cohorts. A lot of them were simply samples that happened to be in the laboratory that people took out and then went back to the notes. That is not the way you test a test. You have to get your patients prospectively on a case-by-case -case basis over a period of time. But nonetheless, when you look at these, you can actually see that if you have a cutoff of 0.5, you have the highest sensitivity and the lowest specificity. And if you have a cutoff of 1.5, you have the reverse. That's very typical of all the tests that you will see, be it beta D-glucan, PCR, or whatever. What I liked especially about the, 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 the Cochrane analysis is they tried to answer the question, well, what does the clinician want from this test? Because actually, clinicians are doing two things. They are screening, or they're wanting a, confirm, a confirmation of the diagnosis. And if you look at the data, you will see that a threshold of 0.5 is the ideal threshold for screening because you can exclude invasive aspergillosis simply because you have the lowest number of false negatives. If you're using galactomannan to confirm, you want the higher threshold because you actually want the lowest number of false positives. You want to be sure the of the diagnosis. And this principle was forgotten in the whole exercise but in fact, at the very beginning, when Pasteur brought the test out, they recognized that, but it kind of got lost along the way. So there is now a group re-examining this, and the FDA itself has now noticed this, and they will probably come up with a new recommendation, at least for trial purposes, that you have two thresholds, the lower threshold to exclude, and the higher threshold to confirm. And that is based on data like the Cochrane analysis. But how does this help the clinician? And I have to say, working with haematologists, we have fights over this all the time. I don't know whether any of you are familiar with haematologists, but they're probably the most aggressive of all the internists. Uh, they take no nonsense from anybody, but I like that because it keeps me sharp. And I actually shared a room for 20 years with Ben DePau. I don't know whether you know Ben DePau, who is a haematologist. So every Friday we had arguments, we had wine, and we had lots of jokes. <clears throat> One of the things, uh, the questions haematologists asked is, with these definitions, are we hitting the target? Now, this is one. This is from Cardiff, Rosemary Barnes's group. They classified their case, a series of cases, on the old definitions, and about a quarter of them were classified as possible. They then reclassified the same cases with the new definitions. Most of the possibles vanished. So the clinicians suddenly had been treating cases which were now considered unclassified. unclassified. You might not think that's important, but in a place like Belgium, it is important because if you don't meet one of those definitions and you treat the patient, the hospital has to pay the cost of the drug because it's not reimbursed by the insurers. And they want to go a step further and actually take the money for the drug off the doctor's salary. That hasn't happened yet, but that's the, the way these insurers are actually thinking. So the question really is, is are we hitting the target or not? And this is my view of hematologists. You see it down there. Microbiologists are friends, not food. Yeah? And we have to convince them because on the ward, they're king. And there's the two little microbiologists down the bottom here who are actually terrifying. So one of the things I got together with an infectious disease physician, Marcio Nucci, Johan Martins, myself, and Raoul Herbrecht, and we went through this and said, can we identify patterns of invasive fungal disease based on radiological signs and symptoms and clinical symptoms and based on mycology and if you look across the table here you can see 
that you have different patterns, depending on whether a biomarker is positive, whether the culture is positive, or whether there are clinical signs and symptoms which don't meet the criteria for the URTC, and whether there are clinical signs and symptoms that do meet the URTC. And on that basis, you can ask the question, is there evidence of disease, and is there evidence of infection, making perhaps an artificial distinction, but nonetheless a workable distinction? Because if you can manage to treat infection before it becomes disease, you're probably going to prevent the patient from developing disease in the first place. And how does that relate to the URTC, MSG criteria? You see that only category C4, D and E actually would be classifiable according to the URTC, whereas class F, category C1, 2 and 3 would be ones the clinicians actually want to treat. So this actually gives you a justification, and we, one of the things we now want to do is test this on a clinical trial basis, but this would at least give you some rationale for allowing people to treat patients instead of just treating them empirically or not treating them at all. <clears throat> now, I want to explore very briefly the whole notion of empirical therapy. Fever is not, not and should not be the basis of a diagnosis, certainly not in the complex patients we're talking about, because there are many causes of fever. In a stem cell transplant uh, patient, for example, it could be the chemotherapy, the irradiation, it could be gut damage. You heard a talk uh, um, earlier this morning about, about the microbiome. It could be the microbiome in a damaged gut scenario. There are all kinds of other explanations other than fungal infection of why a patient has fever, because if it's one of those explanations, the patient will remain febrile until the underlying problem has vanished. And that can be days, sometimes even weeks. So fever should not be considered one of the, the, the diagnostic criteria. It was in the original uh, 2002 definitions, but we dropped it for this very reason. Fever is not a sign of invasive fungal disease. It may coincide with it, but it's not a sign. Another reason for not having fever is this is a survey done in the UK of how people define fever. And if you actually look at it, there are all kinds of different thresholds for fever among jobbing haematologists. There were 490 centers involved here. And you'll see that although the majority chose a temperature in excess of 38.5 or two, two temperatures of more than 38 to define fever, that's about one third of them, the official definition is actually the one below that, 38.3 uh, or two temperatures above 38. And only 10% of the centers actually use that as the definition. So that's reminding you that even defining fever is difficult. Measuring fever is even more difficult, but I won't go into that just now. <clears throat> now, this is some experience. A long time ago, I was involved in that's the Netherlands with a Belgian center and a UK center. And we looked at the whole issue of definitions, how well definitions are applied. So here you have defined infection, 57% in Holland, 80% in the UK and Belgium. Okay. Severity of infection, you see it's more severe in Holland than it is, and these are all AML patients, by the way, but almost the same type of patients, and only 2% severe in the UK. Condition of the patient, poor or critical, the vast majority of Dutch people were considered as poor or critical, whereas only 1% in the UK. And when it comes to sepsis syndrome, which is, has definitions, hypertension, which is objectively verifiable, only 24% 20, in Holland and only 1% in Belgium. How is that possible? Rigors and chills, another thing that's objectifiable, is the, the vast majority in Belgium and Holland, but very few in the UK. Tachycardia, you can measure that. 86% in Holland, only 6% in Belgium. What is going on here? And then malaise, three quarters of the Dutch and none in Belgium and the UK. What can you conclude from this? Well, infection makes the Dutch feel miserable, the Belgians quiver, but merely quickens the British pulse. This shows you how bad clinical science can actually be. Yeah? Okay, and another thing is how do you define persistent fever? These are all definitions of persistent fever which have been used. The commonest one is 72 hours. Where did that come from? If you look at a population of neutropenic patients who, who have a bacterial infection which responds to antibiotics, the median duration of fever is four and a half days. So, although clinicians will use antifungals after two to three days, and if the patient responds, they'll say, see, it was a fungus, it's nonsense. So it should be consigned to the dustbin. And when a patient is febrile despite antibiotics, 
this is what actually happens in the ward. Is the patient febrile? Yes or no? Do you have a diagnosis? Yes or no? Are you anxious about the patient? Yes or no? Is it out of hours? Yes or no? And all roads lead to empirical therapy. So, the whole notion of empirical therapy is rightly under fire. And the other thing is, as I said, four and a half days median time, even if the patient is responding to therapy, you still have the decision a couple of days down the line what you're going to do, so you need some help. And this is where the laboratory comes back into play. Let's look quickly at prophylaxis. A lot of prophylaxis has been used. I was deeply disappointed to discover that posaconazole has been discovered even in Australia. Posaconazole is everywhere. And it, you know, the, the myth has been sown that posaconazole is, is an anti-aspergillus drug, whereas itraconazole isn't. That's a piece of nonsense. But it's now become folklore. Itraconazole was also very effective, but it was never tested properly and has now vanished from the scene. But let's stick with uh, posaconazole prophylaxis. This is a, a study which has not been repeated, clearly suggesting if you give prophylax, antifungal prophylaxis, you're going to have an impact at least on galactamana. Why does she say that? Well, she has a population where they had no antifungals, time to diagnosis, and a population where they had antifungals, and you can actually see the sensitivity drops. Looked at another way, the, patient, the proportion of patients who were detected, for, or galactomannan was detected in, was higher in those that had no antifungals than had antifungals. So it seems that if you give, an, give um, a mold active prophylaxis, you can forget about screening with galactomannan. We don't know what, whether that's true of beta d glucan, and we certainly don't know whether that's true of PCR. But for galactaman, and there are good biological reasons for saying, if you're giving mold active prophylaxis, don't bother screening for galactaman because the test is going to be less sensitive and less effective. But there's another reason for, for saying that, and it's pure, pure, it's pure mathematics. This is the study of Cornelli, posaconazole versus fluconazole, itraconazole, about 300 patients in each group. 7% of those in the, in the so-called control group had aspergillosis compared with 1% in the posaconazole group. Okay, if you do the numbers game and you look at the pretest probability and you assume that pretest probability was uh, fluconazole, itraconazole was 7% and you have that sensitivity and specificity for galactomannan or PCR, which is about right, about 80% in both cases, the posterior probability is actually 29%. So the, the positive predictive value is 29% for your test, and the negative predictive value is 99%. Okay, but if, as soon as you look at the posaconazole group, the posterior probability is dramatically affected because the prior probability is 1%, and now the positive predictive value of your test is only 5%. So you can't, you're not going to detect the cases. It's as simple as that, just purely to do with mathematics. And, of course, the negative predictive value is still high, but then you don't know whether that's truly negative or falsely negative. So simply on that basis, that would remind you, if you give posaconazole or any other mold and anti-mold prophylaxis, then a, a screening test will not actually prove very effective for you. So if somebody is giving prophylaxis, don't give them a galactomannan test. Just simply say no, if you dare to. <coughs> And that brings us to this whole group, the diagnostic driven group. This is where people are focusing diagnostic driven their, uh, um, um, approach. Why is that important? Well, here you, you've got a classification of your proven and probable cases at the top, and on the, the, your left hand side, you have the test outcome, positive or negative. When you're screening, and as I mentioned earlier, you want the lowest number of false negatives. And when you're trying to make a diagnosis, you're actually wanting the lowest number of false positives. So when you're screening, this is how you screen. You need to screen regularly. Once a week is not enough. We now know that. It's twice a week, and we do it Mondays and Thursdays, and most people do Mondays and Thursdays as well, is the way to actually detect uh, um, your, your galactomannan or even your PCR, as I'll show you in a minute. And then you have these different triggers for moving up into your diagnostic workup. Screening test positive, but it could also be respiratory signs on a chest x-ray or the patient's coughing or some other reason. And you can even build in, as some people do, protracted unexplained fever of at least five days, not three days. Then you do your diagnostic workup by ordering a CT scan. 
That's one way of, in which you can actually go after your patients. This is a study coming from Australia. It was a difficult study to do. It was published in Lancet Infectious Diseases, and they looked at the combination of galactamanin and PCR, even though PCR is not standardized. <clears throat> so it involved, if I'm not mistaken, Adelaide, Melbourne, and Sydney. And um, as I said, it was a difficult study to do, and I, was given the, I had the privilege of writing a commentary on it, so I had the privilege of also digging into the paper. So they have to be actually respected simply for actually achieving their objective in doing a study because they are difficult to do. They had 250 patients enrolled and they were assigned either to a standard diagnostic or to a biomarker-driven uh, um, approach. And that involved them testing galactamine and PCR twice weekly. And if you know, there was a signal from either GM, a galactamine or a PCR, order a CT scan and then treat if probable or possible. If the tests were negative and there was no fever, you didn't order a CT scan and you didn't treat the patient. So you're already going to reduce the number of patients that require treatment. And then the, depending on whether you had persistent fever or not, you ordered a CT scan and depending on that outcome, you treated or not. So, oh, sugar, sorry. The results were as follows. Clearly there were more proven and probable cases in the, um, uh, the, the, the biomarker driven group. But, there were much fewer patients given treatment unnecessarily. And the mortality was the same. So this is actually tell, uh, more or less answering the question, choose your poison. Do, what do you want to do? Do you actually want to know what you're doing? Or do you just want to guess what you're doing? Empirical is more or less guessing because you're afraid. Whereas the diagnostic driven approach, at least you know what you're doing. And it clearly showed when you detect the cases, you can treat them successfully. A second study has been published as well from the group of Rogers, which is Würzburg and Cardiff. And why I like this is because what they did was looked at the time to detection in relation to the CT scan. So if, if you look at Galactomanan, you can see that 45 cases were de detected well ahead of requiring to order a CT scan on Galactomanan. About the same number with PCR, but when you combine the two, in other words, a signal from either one or the other, you could actually detect 64% of the cases ahead of CT scan. Again, emphasizing the importance of screening. If you rely on the CT scan alone, you're going to be chasing your tail. And then, of course, you have the targeted group, and they're fairly straightforward. Classical examples, pulmonary invasive aspergillosis, where you're going to be looking for so-called specific or semi-pathognomonic signs on a, a CT scan. And they will depend on where the patient actually is. A neutropenic patient, you will see lesions, small lesions, nodules, sometimes with a halo sign, whereas post-neutropenic patients, you will see things from the air crescent sign to the actual cavity. And there are clear descriptions in the definitions for the tests you should use, direct tests, um, culture, um, and also there's also directions for using galactomanan. And that is becoming increasingly more popular. But we mustn't forget, sometimes you see a lesion like this where you want an interventional radiologist to stick a needle in because what you actually see and grow is not aspergillus. It's another mold altogether, in this case, rhizopus. And we could rescue this patient because we treated the patient with ambisome and took them off the foriconazole they were on. <clears throat> But the commonest sample you take from the lump is actually bronchoscopy, and it's, all, it's particularly the bronchial alveolar lavage. Now, I'm not going to go into the mechanics of this, and, and there's the fact that no two bronchial alveolar lavages are the same, but I just want to explore biomarkers and bronchial alveolar lavage. This is a study of Johan Martins, where he had a population of patients that had no invasive aspergillosis, but had a bronchial alveolar lavage obtained because they were ill. And when you looked at them, the vast majority of, of samples had very low levels of galacto, or very low indices, rather, uh, for the ELISA galactomanin test, as you might expect. And when you looked at a group of proven and probable invasive aspergillosis, the vast majority of them had very high indices. The question then is, where do you set this threshold? And, and, and again, what is the question you want to do? You're not going to do a bronchial alveolar lavage to exclude invasive aspergillosis as your primary question. You have a reason for doing it. Oops, you have a reason for doing it. You've seen a lesion, you've ordered a bronchial alveolar lavage, you want to know 
you want to confirm the diagnosis rather than exclude the diagnosis. So you actually want to know, is this invasive aspergillosis? Because the prior probability is that it is going to be invasive aspergillosis. The vast majority of pulmonary invasive as um, mold diseases are aspergillosis. If you set the threshold at 1.5, you get close to the right answer, although you will see four green dots, which are false positives. And you will see two red dots, and actually most likely more than that, who are falsely negative. But what it's telling you is, if you have a positive galactomannan, you can believe the result. So you can work on the assumption you really are talking about invasive aspergillosis. <clears throat> so having come this far then is, well, how do we integrate all this information? And, you know, what does a diagnostic-driven approach actually mean? Well, it means actually going after clinical or microbiological evidence as objectifiably uh, as, as, positive, as possible. And the aim is to include patients that are likely to have the disease, but exclude those that don't. So you don't need to treat them unnecessarily. And that's becoming even more important in days where we're talking about patient safety, unnecessary exposure to drugs, unnecessary risks, etc. This is an algorithm produced in Leuven based on galactomannan, five days fever, pulmonary signs and symptoms, and aspergillus found in, a, in, in, in sputum culture, any one of those positive, and basically you ordered a CT scan and managed the patient from then onwards. When he did this, he actually had 117 patients with persistent or recurring fever. Um, only nine of those 41 cases actually had invasive aspergillosis, and he managed to reduce antifungal treatment from 35% to 8% just by that simple maneuver, showing very clearly that it's worth pursuing. A group of us got together and published a, a supplement in the Journal of Antimicrobial Chemotherapy, which is available online if you want to know the thinking behind this, but we came up with integrated care pathways based on risk, low risk to high risk, based on whether you gave prophylaxis or not, and recognizing that some people would prefer empirical to diagnostic driven irrespective of the prophylaxis. But we also said, well, empirical treatment should only be used where you don't have diagnostic facilities available. And even if you do use it, it should be used for a restricted period of time. You should only use it to buy time until you can confirm or exclude the diagnosis and not go on for weeks. And typically that's five to seven days maximum. Diagnostic driven requires you to have screening tests, preferably on site, getting the results back the same day or earlier the next day, having a CT scan readily available and having someone who's prepared to, to intervene by doing a bronchoscopy or even a fine needle aspirate of the affected site. As it happens, the group of Morrissey published an algorithm where they, had, they said more or less the same about empirical therapy. It should be reserved where you're not sure, where, you, where you, you don't have the facilities available, but it should be restricted to a short period of time. And they divided their approach in terms of not on prophylaxis, on, on fluconazole or itraconazole prophylaxis, or mold active prophylaxis. And then you decide whether you're going to do a biomarker-based diagnostic approach. And in the foriconazole, posiconazole prophylaxis group, they recognized the potential negative effect of these azoles on your test performance. So actually, you have to go for a targeted diagnostic strategy. From a laboratory perspective, that means a minority of patients would have to have the complete workup. The bulk of the patients would actually, uh, be, be, their needs would be met by screening alone. Are they all the same? Well, I've now tasted Vegemite, and I, and I can guarantee Vegemite is not the same as Marmite. It's sweeter. It's slightly more salty. Um, I haven't tasted Promite yet, but I guarantee I will do that before I go home. So the point, point about the context of the test is you have to actually ask these questions. Who's the patient? What's the clinical history? When was he last examined? What were the findings? Where is he now? And can I, as a laboratory, help? So to wrap this up there, one of the things I'd love to see, I wished I had, could have seen it before I actually finally retire, but I don't think I will. But nonetheless, I, I live in hope. You have got, um, oh, sorry, that's the wrong slide. Various instances of aspergillus in various centers. This is from the Transnet study, and you can see the red bars are aspergillus, the blue are candidiasis. You can see the instances vary all over the place. The question every one of us has to ask is, which is your center? If your center L, you have high-risk patients. If your center R, you have very low-risk patients. That will define which route you want to take. You have to know what your incidence is. <clears throat>
And on that basis, one of the algorithms you could use is the risk of invasive aspergillosis. If it's already 10% or more, you could start treatment with antifungals immediately. No one would question that. You might also have to abandon the procedure if you're doing a stem cell transplant, for example. If the risk is less than 10%, you can screen because you were able to establish the estimate of the a priori risk and then you ask the test the question, is the test going to add anything? Is it going to alter the likelihood? If the answer is yes, ask for it. If the answer is no, don't bother asking for it. How many clinicians do this these days? Very few of them. Why is that important? Well, if you have a risk of 4.5% and you have a test with that sensitivity and specificity, if you have a positive result, about one in five year of those positives will actually indicate disease. And this is what we should actually see in the report. Antigen was detected in the sample given the performance of the test and the risk estimate for your patient. The chance he has invasive disease is about one in six you would want to treat. Conclusion, start antifungal treatment for invasive aspergillosis. If the test is negative, you have the alternative situation, the antigen is not detected and given the performance of the test and the risk for your patient, the chance he has invasive aspergillosis is less than one in a hundred. Problem is clinicians don't believe that, but in fact that's true. So the conclusion should be do not start antifungal therapy, but continue to monitor the patient. That's all I have to say. I hope I haven't bored you to death, and I'm more than happy to take any questions. Thank you very much.